Welcome back to Homegoings and our final episode of season one. This is a two part episode and this is part two. So if you haven't listened to part one, I highly recommend you go back and do that. Trust me, with this topic, context is everything. And if you're continuing your listen, you know that today I'm speaking with Rachel Dolezal, who we've learned is a mother, a gardener, and a viral celebrity of sorts, who identifies racially as human and culturally as Black, but was born biologically white. So far, this episode has been about getting to know Rachel the person, while challenging pretty much everything we know about the idea of race as a deconstructed social construct. In short, are we erasing race? Could we, even if we tried? Here's one hard truth as to why Rachel's story went so viral or made a mark at all. When it comes to activism, Rachel does not come to play. She is qualified with a capital Q. I mean, before and after 2015, in the Pacific Northwest, Rachel was by all intents and purposes doing the work. So I've been doing a lot of human rights work in North Idaho as director of Human Rights Education Institute. Um, There were a lot of hate crimes targeting my work because there are five hate groups in North Idaho, white supremacy groups. to have their headquarters there. So it was it was like there were there were some things that were happening before I became president of the Spokane NAACP. As mentioned earlier, Rachel was also the Spokane, Washington branch president of the NAACP in 2015, a highly regarded position in the world of civil rights and a position traditionally held by majority black leaders. So the process for the NAACP is you have to be nominated. You don't just decide you want to go be the president. (laughs) I was nominated based on that work that I'd been doing for a number of years in the in the Pacific Northwest. The secretary and treasurer both um, nominated me to on the ballot. So there was the incoming um, president who was running. And then there was me, there was nobody else running or, you know, nobody else nominated to run against the incumbent. So my only choice would have been removing my name from the ballot. A lot of people are like, oh, you just pretended to be black so you could be president of the NAACP. Like, you know, saying theoretically that somebody would do that, that doesn't even work because there's no kind of like application form where you check black or white. Literally, you only get nominated if you have powerful advocacy work that's how the NAACP So, so the, NAACP, the NAACP doesn't care if people who are white apply? There's no application. Okay. So, so would, they nominate, would they nominate a officer. white person? I don't, I, you know, like this is literally the officers who have been elected have to nominate and they tend to nominate people who are effective advocates, period. In June of 2015, following her viral explosion that sparked a nationwide conversation about race, Rachel stepped down as the president of the Spokane branch. In a message to the organization's executive committee, she said her resignation was in the best interest of the NAACP. And though I clearly have more to learn about how the NAACP nominates its presidents, I think this is another big reason we cared so much about Rachel. She left us wondering... Did she need to be Black, look Black, and claim Blackness to do this work? Couldn't she have gotten this far in her work, or maybe further, if she chose to present the way she was biologically born, as a white woman? And really, can you do good work in a bad way? How do we square that? I turn to my panel of experts to discuss. Mia Schultz, president of the Rutland, Vermont NAACP, Kwame Danqua of 95 X. You'll be hearing more from them, as well as my colleague Jane Lindholm, throughout this part of the episode. This is some pretty heady stuff to grapple with alone. The thing is, there are white branch presidents. Like There are white branch there presidents. There are white branch presidents. Like, that is not like a requirement to be black and be a president. So for me, it baffles me still. You could have still been the president of the NAACP branch in Spokane if you were just honest. Mm. Yeah. Honesty matters. Yeah. Right. And this felt dishonest, even though it's Rachel's truth. Right. She doesn't feel like she's being dishonest. Right. Right. If you had one question to ask Rachel, what would you have asked? I would ask her, knowing how these things tarnished the good acts and good deeds you did as an activist, 
and how this affected your children and your extended family of people that you've met in your travels. What would you do differently? Hmm. Like all those years of activism she did, all the years of artwork that she did, that was, you know, not even not even debatable. Good work. Oh, that her was artwork urban. is beautiful. And it was erased. All of that erased. What would she do differently? Mm -hmm. My question would be um, a combination of both. So why not differently? Why not differently? Like, why couldn't you just be a good ally? What was wrong with being a good ally and using your privilege? Lord knows we need all of the allies that we can get. And we need those people who can bring who can bring other white people to the understanding of what black people go through and have gone through. So my question be, why not differently? Yeah. You've had so much experience in change making, in child rearing from age 14, essentially sewing uh, diapers together for your black siblings. That thread, that through line we spoke about, about wanting to connect, but also protect, but also have your own connections and your own interests and your own fascinations. And then adopting your brother Isaiah as your own son. When and, and how did things start to kind of find its shape for you with your own identity and in, in your relationship to blackness? If you can hear me struggling here, it's because I am. I had to figure out a way to ask Rachel straight up, homie, when did you decide to be black? And yes, as much as I, like Kwame, also love to meet people exactly where they're at when it comes to their identity, I'm going to use the word decide here. Enough already. So um, I think that that, I don't know that there's like a shifting point in terms of, you know, like a moment, right? Race is a social construct. We're all the human race. We're all technically members of the black human race because <laughs> we all go back to a black mother. So black is the one label that everybody pretty much already has. They just don't know it. And um, you know, if you learn it and know it and want to look to your ancestors for inspiration, that's okay. I think that there are some key elements, some key moments, like a, a scattering of them. Um, and when I think, you know, I think anybody thinks back, right? When somebody has an aha moment, then you think of like, when I was a child, was I exhibiting this? Was this showing up? You know, is this real? Because you kind of check in with yourself, like, is this something that's been consistent over my whole, like it keeps showing up, then it's like, okay, we need to pay attention to that. Or is this just like a phase? And so that's kind of, you know, I think that when everybody's like, how do I know, like, I'm really interested in this. And it's like, well, if it's a phase, it will end. <laughs> you know, just just write it out <laughs> and you'll know, right? And if it's not a phase, you're gonna see every decade of your life, this thing coming back to you. How you show up in the world, I think authentically is driven by how much you pay attention to those si signs and signals. So when I was little and you know, I was instinctively drawing pictures of myself with the brown crayon and was, you know, being corrected for that. Like, that's not, that doesn't look like, why, why are you doing this? This doesn't look like you. So paying attention to when I was doing something instinctively, I was dancing and I was not allowed. Um, I was, you know, whatever, whatever I was doing as a child and it was censored. Then as an adult, what do I, what am I drawn to in college? That's, that's a, time a time when you get, get to explore. explore. I'll admit, Hearing Rachel use the word explore when it comes to my race feels so, I don't know, itchy to me. Like the audacity, right? To explore my skin, my traditions, my hair, my culture. 
It's like trying me on like a suit. And then you get to change your mind and take the suit off, only to try on countless others until the right one fits. There's something about the black body in all of this that feels sacred. Lynchings, whippings, beatings, rape, one dropped, Jim Crowed, back of the bust, shot and kneeled on by police. This is how our bodies have been treated. How do you explore that? Why should you get to? But then again, Rachel says she's always felt this identity inside since she was little. And race hasn't been the only social construct at the table up for debate. Here's my colleague Jane Lindholm again. Jane is a lot of things. Being white is one of them. A veteran journalist who's known for leaning into challenging questions and pushing back in interviews is another. In the world of news, Jane's a beast. You know, you you don't want to talk about gender, but why, you know, why is someone transitioning more valid or not something you would question? Is it because it's not something that you question in yourself? Yeah, yeah. I 100% fully believe that people, they have every right to, you know, be who they were really meant to be and, and, and to make changes to their body to to be free of the shackles of feeling like they're in the wrong body or, you know, whatever the journey may be. But Rachel is confusing to me. It's different and it's confusing to me because it feels like a mockery. It feels like a mockery. Uh, It feels like passing too far and it can be changed back. It can be taken off and she can just go, go about her life. That's really, really Hard for me to understand. Um, I, you know, I mean, I don't think they're the same. But I do believe that people... I do believe in the autonomy of people to tell you who they are and to be, to live authentically in who they are. Um, you know, again, I don't feel like I get to determine someone's gender. I also don't determine their race, racial identity or race. That's a lot of policing. You are determining what you see as her experience and appearance and upbringing and um, background. Is that your job? This discussion is just one of many that exploded after Rachel's story came to light. It broke something open nationwide around racial fluidity. And the example of trans identity was kind of the hook to hang your hat on. It was the ultimate comparison. All you have to do is Google transgender and transracial to see headlines asking the same questions. Headlines like, why shouldn't we compare transracial to transgender? Or if Americans can be transracial, can they be transgender? It even became politicized with one article reading, if progressives believe gender is fluid, then why not race? And to this day, the parameters around gender and race continue to seemingly change shape, expand, and then shrink again. And all the ways we have usually biologically self-defined, it isn't as usual anymore. At this point, I wonder if the idea of racial classification is archaic. I don't know. But I think the question lies not in whether people like Rachel are, in fact, Black, given the list of Blackness we ticked through earlier, but whether they should be. After all, there are things that come with being Black American that simply can't be shared. I'm sure not the first to ask this, but have you had a moment where you've had to be like, Okay, but slavery. How do you how do you find kin- kinship in the communities or even in your activism um, when you don't have that same shared experience? You know what I mean? Historical experience. Does that remove you from some of the conversation or some of that kinship? Yeah. So I mean, it would remove um, me from things like reparations. It would remove me from that's why I never identified as African American, which is very different than identifying as part of the Black diaspora. So I think that um, there needs to be some nuance in terms of, of how racism affects 
everyday lived experience for people who may not be African American. I, I mean, I think it comes down to um, yes, there are Black people in America who are not um, descendants of chattel slavery, and there are Black people all over the world that aren't as well, and there are people all over the world that are. So that's one piece that um, is either part of your lineage or it isn't. There are people who do have those ancestors and there are people who don't. Like where you go back and who you come from, I think we need to have a broader view of that, you know, beyond. Obviously, you know that your history on the black side doesn't start with slavery. You know, you still know that there's that history before. So that wasn't the starting point. And I think some, you know, sometimes, sometimes that's empowering to people. I did my DNA test, it was like 10% North African. And I'm like, I don't know. One of my friends was like, oh my gosh, like all the people um, in um, Egypt or whatever, like she's found some little region and she's like, they all look like your cousins, blah, blah, blah. You know, people start seeing things. I don't know that that necessarily has as much meaning to me as what's in my heart and in my spirit and in my soul. And I think that's okay. Like sometimes we draw meaning from our physicality and from the stair steps that go back in that physicality. But I also think that there's, we have a mind and we have a spirit and sometimes the mind and the spirit, um, are going to be more powerful in terms of um, our allegiances and where we find our home. You know, one of the things that I wonder about with you, Myra, is like, why do you think you find her so offensive in in a way that it's like, I, I can't quite get beyond this? Why can't you dis, just discount her? What do you think it is that you're like, you still feel, you feel angry and offended, but you, but but also not able to just be like, whatever, they don't have anything to do with me, and they don't matter. I think if I dig deep, Rachel is a threat to everything many of us Black people in the United States have been taught about survival um and i'm also not able to discount something that feels like it's being presented as this overarch overarching opportunity that everyone can have right yes yeah the audacity to say yeah i think i'll i think i'll just yeah, I'm going to claim this too. I can claim anything. I think that's part of it, Myra, is this white belief, whether you know I believe it in myself or not, that I can lay claim to anything. I can even lay claim to your blackness. You don't get to claim your blackness, and you don't get to tell me I can't claim your blackness. I am white. I can claim what I want. I think that's certainly the history we have in this country and in many countries. And I think, you know, when we drill down, that's part of it, right? It's like, you white people think you can claim anything, even our blackness. Fuck you. Right. And isn't this all a fight towards normal? Like, aren't we all in this, you know, in this work of equity and belonging to get a middle ground somewhere an equal footing to, like, repair the wounds of our past? And... Like, is, is this how you do it? Like, I don't know. I mean, I'll say something. Rachel, like, you're not wrong. Yeah, I think I think you're right that she's not wrong. But that doesn't erase history, and it certainly doesn't change the present experience for melanated people in this country just because she's not wrong. So what what it is 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 her correctness doing more harm than more harm than good? To, you, to your point in your question, do I have the right to police anybody's identity? No, but I do have the right to be offended. I do have that right. Yeah, I do have the right to be hurt. Does Rachel's process offend you? 
Yeah. Because we don't live in a world where we have deconstructed race. I, it is a social construct, but we have not deconstructed it. So we are living in a in a world and um, a society that is built on this painful history and that is not at a place of equality. And as I said earlier, I don't think that people who have had the privilege of whiteness biologically and culturally it, it does offend me to then lay claim on blackness. Identity is defined as, quote, the fact of being who or what a person or thing is, what it is, what you are, the fact of it all. There doesn't seem to be much choice in that definition. And so I get the societal need to buck its restrictiveness. Historically, most things this rigid have had a moment in time where they've been challenged or taken down. Nobody really likes a box. I think what's hard for me is that my identity has never felt like a box. My blackness has never just felt like census data. It's a big part of my purpose, some part of my past. And the thing to say, that nose, that hand gesture, that ritual, the way I walk in this world, that came from you, Grandmama. My blackness, my identity and blackness is something bigger than just me to pass along to my daughter. It's a stance, a position, a lens. My identity is part of my legacy. I want to look in the literal and metaphorical mirror and be proud. My identity is not up for grabs. I think the thing is that since Rachel's scandal broke in 2015, most of us have still remained in our socially constructed racial constructions. And I feel like I can say with confidence that we are not erasing race anytime soon. But if this episode proves nothing else, it's that when it comes to your identity, apparently you do get to choose some parts of it. This doesn't mean the world we're living in is going to erase history, systems, and time to adapt to your choices. And it certainly doesn't mean everyone is going to like it. But unless there's some kind of policy around it, you might not be stopped either. For today's Deep Listen, Rachel is reading the prologue from her book, In Full Color. Read in her own words about her identity choices without any of that pesky media editing. And I've decided not to add music either, so no emotional manipulation. Untouched. And you get to choose how you feel about this, too. This is Nkechi Amare Jalo, but many of you know me as Rachel Dolajal. I'll be reading the prologue to my book, In Full Color, Finding My Place in a Black and White World. People always ask me what it was like living as a black woman, as if I no longer live that way, as if my blackness were just a costume I put on to amuse myself or acquire some sort of benefits, as if what happened on June 10th, 2015 altered my identity in any way. I'll admit to being thrown for a loop when the reporter from a local news channel in Spokane, Washington, who was interviewing me about the hate crimes that had been directed at me and my family, abruptly switched topics and asked, are you African-American? On the surface, it was a simple question, but in reality, it was incredibly complex. Yes, my biological parents were both white, but after a lifetime spent developing my true identity, I knew that nothing about whiteness described who I was. At the same time, I felt it would have been an oversimplification to have simply said yes. After all, I did not identify as African-American, I identified as black. I also hadn't been raised by black parents in a black community and understood how that might affect the perception of my blackness. In fact, I grew up in a painfully white world, one I was happy to escape from when I left home for college, where my identity as a black woman began to emerge. Forced into an awkward position by the reporter, 
I equivocated. When he pressed me, I ended the interview and walked away. After footage of the small segment of the interview found its way onto the internet and the article appeared in a local paper, quote, outing me as white, I became one of the hottest trending topics of the day every day for weeks. A handful of people expressed their support of me, but they were drowned out by all the shouting as nearly everyone else on the planet was calling for my head on a platter. I understood why some people reacted negatively to the fragments of my story they'd seen in the news. As a longtime racial and social justice advocate, I knew there were certain lines you simply didn't cross if you wanted to be accepted by your community, whether it be white or black, and crossing the color line was one of them. Because I'd been seen and treated as both white and black, I was intimately familiar with the misgivings both communities had about people who stepped over this ever-shifting line. I also knew the historic consequences for doing so, shaming, isolation, even death. White people created the color line and the taboo for crossing it as a way to maintain the stranglehold and privilege they've always enjoyed. But due to the painful history surrounding it, many black people had also grown adamant about enforcing it. If they weren't allowed to cross the color line, at least they could take ownership of their side. As such, if you dared to cross the boundary, As I have done and were exposed, you were put in a no-win situation. White folk would see you as a traitor and a liar and never trust you again. And black folk might see you as an infiltrator and an imposter and never trust you again. As severe as these repercussions were, they didn't dissuade me from making this journey. For not doing so would have meant turning my back on what I see as my true identity and leaving those I loved most in a vulnerable position. If I've hurt anyone in the process... I do sincerely apologize. That was never my intention. To most people, the answer to the reporter's question was binary, yes or no. But race has never been so easily defined. In a letter to Thomas Gray in 1815, Thomas Jefferson struggled to determine, quote, what constituted a mulatto, calling it, quote, a mathematical problem of the same class with those of mixtures of different liquors and different metals, In 1896, the case Plessy v. Ferguson, the U.S. Supreme Court, attempted to clarify the existing racial classifications when it established the one-drop rule. Those with a single black relative, no matter how distant, were considered black, even if they appeared white. But this decision only muddled an already complicated issue. If someone who looked white could be considered black because one of his 16 great-great-grandparents was black, but a black person with a white great-great-grandparent was still regarded as black, what sort of clarity did this provide? If scrutinizing people's appearances can't provide definitive proof of their racial identity, what does? How do you decide whether certain people are white or black? What's the determining factor? Is it their DNA? Is it their skin color? Is it how other people perceive them? Or is it how they perceive themselves? Is it their heritage? Is it how they were raised? Or is it how they currently live? Does how they feel about themselves play a role? And if so, how much? Does one of these questions provide the answer or do all or none of them apply? And finally, does the idea of separate human races have any sort of biological justification or is it merely a creation of racism itself? Adding further confusion, the definition of blackness has not only shifted from decade to decade, but also differs from person to person. For most, blackness comprises much more than one's physical appearance. It's the culture you inhabit and the experiences you've lived. It's philosophical, emotional, even spiritual. Was Michael Jackson black? By the end of his life, his skin was nearly white, and many of his features had been altered in a way that made him look far less black than he did as a boy, but nearly everyone would still respond to that question by saying, oh, of course. How about O.J. Simpson? With his brown skin and curly hair, he appeared black, but the way he viewed himself suggested otherwise. When pressured to pull the race card, he reportedly once said, I'm not black, I'm O.J., an opinion seconded by a helicopter pilot for a film crew that filmed Simpson fleeing the police in his white Ford Bronco on June 17, 1994. If O.J. Simpson were black, that shit wouldn't have happened, she later told the documentary director Ezra Edelman when describing the LAPD's atypical restraint that day. He'd be on the ground getting clubbed. 
Yes, my parents weren't black, but that's hardly the only way to define blackness. The culture you gravitate toward and the worldview you adopt play equally large roles. As soon as I was able to make my exodus from the white world in which I was raised, I made a headlong dash toward the black one, and in the process, I gained enough personal agency to feel confident in defining myself that way. That I identify as one race while the world insists I'm another underscores the psychological harm the concept of race inflicts. Being denied the right to one's self-determination is a struggle I share with millions of other people. As our culture grows less homogenous, more and more people are finding themselves stuck in a racially ambiguous zone, unable or not allowed to identify with the limited available options. One of the few silver linings of the media firestorm that followed my, quote, exposure is that it sparked an international debate about race and racial identity. I didn't set out to be the spokesperson for people stuck somewhere in the gray zone between black and white, but after my own life was thrown into disarray because of this issue, I'm happy to share my whole story in the hope that it will bring about some much needed change. I became aware long ago that the way I identify is unique and I knew that I would need to talk about it eventually, but I hoped I could choose the time, the place, and most importantly, the method. Unfortunately, when the footage of the reporter in Spokane asking me if I was African-American went viral, whatever chance I might have had to introduce myself to the world on my own terms while explaining the nuances of my identity was taken from me. Do I regret the way the interview ended and as a consequence, the way my story was presented to the world? Of course, but as you'll see, the evolution of my identity was far too nuanced and frankly private to describe to a stranger. How can you explain, in a brief conversation on the street, a transformation that occurred over the course of a lifetime? You can't. To truly understand someone, you need to hear their whole story. And so I wrote this book so you can hear mine. Well, folks, that's a wrap of season one of Homegoings. Six months, 13 episodes, and a whole lot of brown and black storytelling. We did it. You did it. You listened. So thank you so much for rocking with me since the inception of this righteous space for art and race. It has been a pleasure being here with you. And if this is your first listen, well, now you know that we have 13 episodes, so feel free to start at the top with episode one. You can do that wherever you get your podcasts or at homegoings.co. And this was one heck of an episode to end on, am I right? Special thanks to all who made it happen, like Corey Doxer, who helped immensely with data points and fact-checking, Shannon Ayers, Rachel's manager, and Brittany Patterson for hyping me up when it came to my desire to tackle such a complex topic. As per usual, thanks to Elodie Reed, the graphic artist behind all of our Homegoings artist portraits. Rachel's self-portrait is front and center on this one. She actually made it with acrylic and eggshells, which is fascinating. So check it out at homegoings.co. While you're there, you can sign up for our newsletter and give us a follow on Instagram at wearehomegoings. This episode was mixed, scored, and reported by me, Myra Flynn. I also composed the theme music. All other music is by Jay Green and Blue Dot Sessions. Saeed Tijan Thomas Jr. edited this episode, and Jane Lindholm, who you heard from today, did some of that too. James Stewart contributes to so many things on the back end of making this thing come to life. So, what's next? So glad you asked. First of all, I'm going to take a little time off to self-care, reflect and bask in some of these feelings of gratitude. What a gift it's been to make this thing. Then I'm going to throw a party. That's right. If you recall, around this time last year, five artists from the podcast took to the stage for Homegoings, a live performance. We filmed that performance, made a whole series out of it, and then put that out as well. It's a whole dope thing. And on February 17th, it's happening again. And you were invited. 
This time it will be held at Chandler Center for the Arts in Randolph, Vermont, and include a whole new lineup of artists from this season. So keep an ear on this feed to hear upcoming details about who you'll be seeing and what they'll be sharing. In the meantime, don't sleep on those tickets, which are out now. This thing got big quickly last year, and you don't want to miss out. You can grab them at vermontpublic.org slash events. And when it comes to the podcast, we are greenlit for season two. So any story ideas you'd like to pitch or people you think I should talk to, write to me at hey at homegoings.co. You'll be hearing from me soon enough, homegoing homies. As always, you are welcome here. <laughs>